First John chapter 5, I want us to uh, read, the, just to begin with, just the 13th verse. We're going to look at more than that. First John chapter 5 and verse 13. First John chapter 5 and verse 13. John writes and says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, two times in this verse, John says, believe on the name of the Son of God. We're going to talk about that this evening, but right now let's pray. Father, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for testimonies that we've heard tonight. Lord, I just pray that you'd bless and help us. Now as we look into your word, open our understanding, cause us to be people who understand what you have done for us, what you will do for us, what you want to do for us. And Lord, cause us to understand our relationship with you in a better way. I direct us in all we do. Lord, if there's a soul here who doesn't know you, may they come to trust you in this hour. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you read through the New Testament, you're going to find that we're told to believe in the Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, we're told to believe in the Lord Jesus at least 16 times. But as you continue to read the New Testament, you're going to also find that we are told to believe on the Lord Jesus, and that happens at least 29 times. So, which is it? Are we to believe in Jesus or believe on Jesus? Well, that question is kind of like asking somebody with a sweet tooth, do you want cake pie or ice cream? <laughs> and they're going to say yes. <laughs> I, I think all of it. Yeah. And it, it's, it's a similar question. Are we believe in Jesus or on Jesus? Yes, we are. In and on in these cases are very similar. If you go back to the Greek, you, you won't find a great deal of difference. But in the English usage of these words, it appears that believing in Jesus is that act of the will by which we decide that Jesus is the Son of God. That he has paid for our sins on the cross. He rose again, guaranteeing our salvation and eternal life. Again, believing on Jesus is not terribly different. It seems to indicate that once we have believed in Jesus, we are secure and we rest in our faith in Jesus. As though Jesus is our foundation, and indeed he is. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Therefore, we are not only saved by, but we are at the same time secure in the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> so, do little words like this make a difference? They do. But let me begin, and we want to look through this chapter of believing on, uh, I'm sorry, believing in the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 1. First word it says, if you're by the black minds in all capital letters, whosoever. We don't use that term a great deal today. I doubt that you last week in the sentence used the word whosoever. You know, unless you were quoting scripture, you probably didn't say something. You know, whosoever. You probably didn't do that. We would say these, this way these days, we would say whoever instead of whosoever. That's the same idea, same concept. Whosoever does what? Whosoever believeth or believes. Anyone may believe. The door is wide open. Whoever wants to come in can come in. And that's exactly what it's saying. But what is it that we're to believe? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ. That is believing in Jesus that he is without question the Savior. And he's the only Savior. Uh, Isaiah 43, the Bible says, I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. Well, it's how does that compare with the New Testament? Well, very easily. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, the New Testament says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So it's saying the same thing in the Old Testament, the same thing in the New Testament. And that's something that a lot of people misunderstand. Some folks think, well, the New Testament kind of contradicts or cancels out the Old Testament. That's just simply not true. Not true at all. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine on one occasion, trying to explain to him about the Bible. He, he 
didn't have a great deal of Bible knowledge. And uh, I was telling him that the New Testament is a continuation of what's taught in the Old Testament. And he thought about it a moment and he said, book two. I said, yeah, exactly, book two, there you go. And it is a continuation of what, that one does not cancel out the other. But John says, whosoever, anyone who believes, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, and the next phrase, very important, is born of God. In Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 3 and verse 7, Jesus says in both places that we must be born again. Now, Nicodemus, to whom he was talking at that time, asked the question, how can a man be born when he is old? And Jesus answered him. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's not talking about physical birth the second time. He's talking about spiritual birth. And to be born again. So we have a clear statement here in 1 John 5, 1. Whosoever, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, he is born of God, born again. Then John adds this as an evidence. And everyone that loveth him that begot, everyone who loves God, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now, throughout 1 John, John emphasizes that loving the brethren is an evidence that you've been saved. If you know the Lord as your Savior, you like to be around other people who know the Lord as their Savior. But we're not saying this. We're not saying that you can't ever talk to anybody who doesn't know the Lord. Right? The opposite of that is true because we're taking the gospel to all the world. And how are you going to take the gospel to everybody if you only speak to people who already know the gospel? That's not going to work out well at all. But what he is saying is that you're going to love those who are brethren. And that's, that's a wonderful truth. Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35, By this shall all men know, he said, New commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. <clears throat> he said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. That's evidence of your salvation. That's evidence that you've been saved, is that you love the brethren. Now, I'm going to interject something here. It's not in my notes, but I think it bears saying at this point. If you know somebody who just hates going to church, they don't want anything to do with it, they don't want to be around Christian people, they don't want to hear anything spiritual, they don't want to read the Bible, can't stand Christian music, they can't stand anything Christian, there's something wrong. Something is wrong spiritually. Either they don't know the Lord at all, or they are bitter against God and have turned their back on him. There's, there's really no other explanation for that. So John is saying that if we love God as our Father, we also have to love the brethren. You know, we've said this here many times, but it's none less true. Uh, some brethren are easier to love than others. Some people are just easy to love. There are people I know, and you know too, who have wonderful, winning personalities, and you just like to be around them. Everybody likes to be around them. They're easy to love. There are other people who don't. They don't have winning, warm personalities, and, and they have particular traits that maybe are, are not pleasant, not friendly in some cases, and they're a little bit harder to love. But the Bible does not say, the Lord did not say, uh, love those that are easy to love. He said, love the brethren. Then, in verse 2, he says, by this we know that we love the children of God. Oh, well, loving the children of God is an evidence of being saved. Here's an evidence that we love the children of God. What is it? Might strike you strange. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, that part's not strange. He's already kind of said that. If you love God, you're going to love God's children. If you love God's children, you're going to love God. That works. But when we love God and keep his commandments, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He did not say, if you want to go to heaven, keep my commandments. He did say, if you love me, keep my commandments. So are we supposed to keep his commandments? Well, if you love him, yes. And if you ask him which commandments, you know, somebody asked him that on a couple of occasions. They said, which commandments should we keep? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind. 
body and spirit, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what about all the others? You know what he said about that? All the others rest upon those two. So, yes, we're to love God, and then they, is that not exactly what John is talking about here? Evidence of being saved is that you love God and you love your brethren. And evidence of that you love the brethren is that you keep the commandments. And if on those two commandments, loving God and loving others, is the whole law, then that, that all comes together. And what Jesus said is what John said. Now you can notice that throughout John's writing, that what he has said is largely an expansion of what Jesus said, a continuation of it, based upon it. So in verse 4 he says this, I'm sorry, verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. It's not hard to obey God. It really isn't. <clears throat> well, I don't know about that. What about the, you know, all those ceremonial washings and, and this and that? Yeah. You know Jesus fulfilled all that. He took care of that for you. His commandments are not grievous. But in verse 4, he says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Now, who's born of God? He that believeth that Jesus is the Christ, who shall believe that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Verse 1. Verse 4, whatsoever is born of God, or those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, overcome the world. What does that mean? We're going to go out and conquer the world? This is our church. It's going to go out and rule the world. It doesn't mean that at all. Doesn't mean anything like that. What it means is we overcome the temptations and the struggles of this world. It means that we overcome the evil of this world. Well, how does that happen? We'll take a look at it again. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So we can overcome the temptations, we can overcome the trials, we can overcome the problems of this world. How? By faith. By faith. What kind of faith? Well, look at verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That's who's overcoming the world. Those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. No question about it. Now, in verse 6, he says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now, let's look at this verse carefully, because there's a great deal in it. The first thing that John says in verse 6 is, This is he that came by water and blood. <laughs> by water and blood. Now, what does that mean? Well, John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, again, Jesus talks about uh, water and spirit. When he's explaining the new birth to Nicodemus, he says, That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is born uh, as spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. So water, in this case, speaks of physical birth. Spirit speaks of spiritual birth. But what about this blood? Well, that speaks of the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Christ. How are we saved? Because we're forgiven. That's how we're saved. And how are we forgiven? Because Jesus' blood was shed to pay for our sins, and the penalty for our sins has been paid. So when we trust, and here's the other element, by faith, then we are forgiven. So he begins verse 6 by saying, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that beareth witness. Because the Spirit is true. Jesus was here in the flesh. Yes, he's the Son of God. And the Spirit bears witness, testifies that he is the Son of God, because the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Now, this is the Spirit of God. So again, here in this verse, verse 6, you have the Trinity. Because you have the you have God here, but you have Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm not sure I quite see it there. We'll then look at the next verse. In verse 7 it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are 
part one. Now that's about as clear a statement as you can find. Let's look at it again. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now notice the Word there is capitalized, and that's the same way John, the same writer, characterized Jesus in Gospel of John, chapter 1, when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here he says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, if you have a Bible other than the King James Bible, uh, there's a good chance that 1 John 5, 7 doesn't read that way in your Bible. It may read like this. There are three that bear record. And what about the rest of them? Is it there? There are only three that I've been able to find, three English translations that have the verse the way you have it here. Now, why is that? I don't want to get off on a, a whole deep subject here, but let me try to explain it to you very succinctly. They are translated from different Greek texts. And the people who translate it, um, there are three that bear record, will tell you their text that they use, the Greek text that they translate in English is the best. But the people that translated it, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one, will tell you their text is the best. So which one is? Well, let's think that through for a minute. Some people will say that, well, that the text that doesn't, that, that do not have the complete verse are the older ones, and the one that has the complete verse is the newer one. I want to challenge that. How can you challenge it? Well, what they mean when they say it's older is they mean they found copies of it in older places than they found <coughs> copies of the other. That does not necessarily mean it was written first. Amen. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So what the reason we have this difference is not so much that it's a better translation, but it's translated from a different source. Are you following? Okay. So the source that your King James Bible is taken from is called the Textus Receptus, or the received text. And the others are come from actually several different texts. So what I'm trying to get across to you is this. I believe what we have here to be the correct rendering. And I don't think there's really a great deal of question about that. I don't think there's any reason to debate it. So there are three that bear record and have a very clear statement. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Let me share something else with you. The way that reads, that's the way John writes. Again, go back and compare it to chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. You can find it's very similar. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I don't think you could have a more clear statement of the Trinity. Very, very succinct. So, verse 8, he says, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now, there are those who want to make the water in verse 8. And again, uh, earlier there, as we looked at it, in verse 6, they want to make that baptism. But I'm going to tell you, as you read this, this chapter, this passage, there's no reference here to baptism. Amen. It's not talking about it. It's not what it's saying at all. So what he says here is this. Verse 8, there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now verse 9 ties verses 7 and 8 together. So pay close attention. If we receive the witness of men, if we believe what men tell us, and quite often we do, and many times that's good, and sometimes it isn't. Well, what do you mean? Well, if people are telling us the truth, it's good that we believe them. If they're not telling us the truth, it's bad that we believe. And I don't know about you, but sometimes with people I have trouble discerning whether they're telling the truth or not. Oh, I don't. I can always tell by their body language how they've been treated. <laughs> I've had people lie to me, and I didn't think they were lying. I didn't have any reason to think they were lying. I found out later they did. They were very convincing, and nothing about them indicated to me that they were not telling the truth. Well, how'd you find out later? Well, either they told me later that they had lied, or evidence came up that proved it. So I 
can't always tell if men are telling the truth, but I know God's always going to tell the truth. Now, let me say something else about men when we move on. I generally believe what people say until I have a reason not to. I'm a very trusting person. If you tell me something, I'm going to take your word for it, unless there's some reason I shouldn't. For example, if you told me that on your way to church tonight, as, as you were coming down Lake Iowa Road, a flying saucer landed in front of your car, and two green men got out and gave you a chicken, I, would, I might find that hard to do. I might question that. <clears throat> well, why? Because those kind of things just don't happen. But generally speaking, if you tell me something, I'm going to take the word for it. Now, don't anybody get any ideas about tricks with you? Because <laughs> you can. But if we receive the witness of men, John says, the witness of God is great. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. This is it. This that you're reading right here. This is the witness of God that he's testified of his Son. And he goes beyond that. We have the witness in ourselves. Look at verse 10. He that believeth on, notice believeth in, believeth on the Son of God, hath the witness in himself. If you know the Lord Jesus, you know in your heart that you know the Lord Jesus. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar. Why? Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. So God calls anybody a liar who does not believe that Jesus is the son of God. Why? Because they deny the record that God has given. Well, what record is that? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 10 again. He that believeth on the son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not. God hath made him a liar because he hath not believed, because he believed not the record that God gave of his son. Where's the record? Next verse. And this is the record. There you go. <laughs> you ask, you receive. Forget it. <laughs> and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Period. Period. That's the record. God has given to us eternal life. This life is in his Son. Again, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, John writes regarding Jesus, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus came to bring life. He's all about life, and life is in him. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. This life is in his Son. If you don't quite follow that, he explains further at verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, it's very clear, and it's, it's that plain and simple. Either you have Jesus and you have life, or you don't have Jesus and you don't have life. There, there's no middle ground. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's not Jesus minus anything. Either you have Jesus and you have life, or you don't have Jesus and you don't. Verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now that's a very important verse. I recommend that you memorize verses 11, 12, and 13. That'll do you a lot of good when you're talking to people. I recommend you memorize a great many other verses. Well, which one should I memorize? Those that speak to you, those that help you, those that will help you in your own life, those that will help you witnessing to others, you ought to memorize them. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Stop right there. Ask yourself, you don't need to raise your hand or answer out loud, just ask yourself, do you believe in the name of the Son of God? Well, first of all, what is the name of the Son of God? Answer that out loud. Jesus. Jesus. All right. So that's the name we're talking about, isn't it? Okay. These things have I written on you, believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, if you believe on the name of the Son of God, you believe on Jesus, these things that are written to you. Isn't that what it says? It says, these things are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God. You say, that's me. I believe in the name of the Son of God. These things are written to you. 
was he written? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may, what's the next word? No. Does it say yes? Does it? Does it say hope? Hope so. Does it say think? No. It says you may know that you have eternal life. Now that's about as clear as it can be. You can know that you have eternal life. How do you know that you have eternal life? And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know that you have eternal life because you believe on the name of the Son of God. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Some people still have trouble with that. I've mentioned here many times in the past, four men, uh, all of them with the Lord now, but were my favorite preachers. And I, I loved each one of them. They, they didn't all preach alike. They had different preaching styles. And I loved each one of them. Uh, knew each one of them. Loved each one of them. I don't preach like any of them. <laughs> kind of wish I did sometimes. They were they were great men of God and great preachers. <clears throat> but one of those was Dr. Fred Brown. That's not a name most of you would know. Fred Brown was an evangelist. He was always an evangelist. He was never a pastor. He was an evangelist all of his adult life. And he talked about on one occasion where he had been preaching in a service, an evening service, and a man came forward to be saved. He said they talked to the man, but the man just could not understand that he could know that he was saved. So Dr. Brown talked to him after the service. He said they sat right down here on the front pew. He said Dr. Brown took his Bible and he said, uh, pointed to 1 John 5, 13. He said, read that. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And after he read it, he told him to read out loud. He said, now, what do you think? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, all right, start at verse 11. Read verse 11 to 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. Dr. Brown said, what do you think? He said, I don't know. I'm not sure. Fred Brown said, read it again. He read it again. What do you think? I, I, I'm just not sure. Well, read it again. He read it again. He must have had him read at least half a dozen times a day more. Finally, the man read it, and it was, he said it was like a light came on. And the fellow said, that's, that's my title deed. That's my title deed. That's my record. That's my title deed. Fred Brown said, right. He said, now do you know what you're saying? He said, I do. You know what, folks, that's your title be. Just as sure as any other public record you could have, there it is. There it is. You can know that you have eternal life. You don't have to guess, hope so, maybe so, think so. You know that you have eternal life. How do you know? Because you believe on the name of the Son of God. This is the record. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. If you have the Son and you have life, or you don't have the Son and you don't have life, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We are changed, born again, when we trust him. And this is that assurance, that blessed assurance that we like to sing about. I think everybody... At least in this church and in most churches I've been in, they love that hymn, Blessed Assurance. And we should. Beautiful hymn. I know several preachers, well-known preachers, said that's their favorite hymn. I can understand that. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased with God. What a blessed assurance that is. Then John is going to talk to us about praying in accordance with God's will. Look at verse 14. He says, and this is the confidence that we have in him. In who? In the Son of God. In the name of the Son of God, in whom we believe, and by which we know that we have eternal life, we have this confidence in him. And if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So you ask anything according to God's will, he hears us. That's good to know. When you pray, God hears you. Verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions 
that we desire of him. Verse 14 is saying we know that God hears us. Verse 15 is saying that we can know that our prayers are going to be answered. Now, somebody's bound to be thinking, yeah, but I, I've known cases where prayers weren't answered, and uh, what happens there? Well, there could be a number of factors there, but one of the keys is found also in verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, I've been asked the question, and, and recently, by the way, but I've been asked the question many times over the years, well, Pastor, if I, if I win the lottery, would you accept the title in the church? I heard a preacher talk about that the other day. You know what he said? I'm not saying this is my position. This is what he said. He said, I would. I'd take it. He said, the devil's had that money long enough. It's time God has it. <laughs> I guess that's one way of looking at it. But the point is this. If we're praying, we need to pray according to God's will. Now, is it God's will for me to win the lottery? I'm going to tell you probably not. For me, I'm not talking about anybody else, but for me, I don't believe it's God's will for me to win the lottery. Therefore, I do not play the lottery. Because <laughs> I don't believe it's God's will for me to win the lottery. All right, now. But if I did, if I prayed, oh, Lord, let me win the lottery. Oh, Lord, let me win the lottery. Oh, Lord, let me win the lottery. And I didn't win. One of them was, God doesn't answer prayer. Really? <laughs> that's not the promise that's given here. It's not. So if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And this is the confidence that we have. We know that he, he hear us whatsoever, uh, and that we have the petitions that we desire in him. Now, there are other things that are God's will and something more serious than the lottery. What about praying for somebody to be healed? Now that's more serious, isn't it? About praying for somebody to be healed in their work. I'm not trying to hurt anybody who is not, who is in that situation. But let me say this. It might not have been the Lord's will to heal that person. Sometimes God has other plans. And the truth of the matter is, you and I are all going to come to the end one day. One way or another. Then again, sometimes it is God's will to heal that. Person. So should we pray? Yes. But we should always pray and seek the Lord's will. And that's what John is teaching us here. That we pray according to God's will. He answers us. He hears us. He answers us. And then he says we ought to pray for those brothers who sin. If you look at verse 16, he says, If any man see his brother in sin, now, there's no period of comment that would stop there. This is a clear statement. Any man see his brother sin. In other words, you're a Christian and you see another Christian sin. Now, before we proceed on, let's say this. Do Christians sin? Yes. Yes. I'd love to say, oh, we reach that point where we no longer sin. But it's just it's not true. It's not true. You can see that in the lives of the great men of the Bible. Abraham is called the friend of God. Did Abraham sin? He did. David's called a man after God's own heart. Did David sin? He did. Samson is the man of whom it is said more times than anybody else that he was filled with the Spirit of God. Did Samson sin? He did. Let's come up to the New Testament. Did Peter ever sin? Well, we know he did. But what about the others? James and John, did they ever sin? Oh, no, not them. But what about the time when they came and they said, Lord, we want to have the right and left seat next to you. Isn't that proud? Yeah, that, that was kind of proud, don't you think? Yeah. I don't know. I look forward to meeting all these folks we read about, all the ones I just talked to you about. But I don't know if you'll meet a finer man than John. Maybe you would. Not for me to say. But he was still a man. And he still was capable of sin. So, 
1 John 5, 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death. We'll say more about that in a second. He shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin not unto death. No, I'm sorry, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, if you see your brother sin, what are you supposed to do? Pray for him. And that's what we all do, isn't it? We see a brother do something wrong, and the first thing we do is we start praying for that brother. Or this first thing we do is we tell somebody else. Do you know what I saw? Do you know what I heard? That's, that's even worse, because you didn't even see it. Do you know what I saw them do? Let me tell you, you're not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell you about it. Why don't we tell God about it? Mm -hmm. That'd be the thing to do. So, he says here, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Then he says, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. What is that? Well, some people tell you, well, there are mortal sins and there are venial sins. And venial sins means the sins that are not unto death, you're not going to die as a result of it. And mortal sins are those sins that can't be forgiven, and you're going to hell no matter what. That's not what it's saying. Well, how do you know it's not what it's saying? Because I read the rest of it. <laughs> what it is saying, at the end of verse 16, is there is a sin unto death. I do not say that you shall pray for it. There comes a point in the believer's life where God just takes him home. Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose you were the President of the United States. And you appointed an ambassador, the president appoints an ambassador, you appoint an ambassador, let's say, to France. And the ambassador is out there on the field in France, at the, the embassy in France. The ambassador isn't doing any of the work that he or she is supposed to do for the United States of America. As a matter of fact, uh, you get reports that they, they don't even show up to office most of the time, and they're out gambling and drinking all the time. And they never uh, represent the United States the way they're supposed to do. And you're the president of the United States, and you find out that this is true. What are you going to do? You're going to call that ambassador home. That's what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. You're going to call him back home, and you're going to replace him with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Hey, suppose God's as wise as the president of the United States. Well, I don't hear a thing yet. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I believe God's a lot wiser than the president of the United States. <laughs> or any other man or woman for that matter. But the point that I'm trying to make is this. You think God would call that ambassador home? Yeah. Now who's to say when you get to that point? Who's to say when a person God? That's not for me to say. I can't make that decision. I don't have the knowledge to make that decision. Only God has that knowledge. And you need to understand that. Well, preacher, you say any time a Christian dies young, it's because they, no, there's been some great servants of God who have died very young. I could name several right off the top of my head. And we're not saying that. God knows when it's time to call the ambassador home. He does. Verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, all of it is. There is a sin, not unto death. And what John put that in there for, I'm quite sure, so you don't have to say every time you mess up, every time you sin, oh my goodness, God's going to kill me. No. God is long-suffering and gracious. There is a sin, not unto death. Then he says in verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. What a wonderful statement that is. What he's saying is this, and it's very clear when it says whosoever is born of God sinneth not, he's saying we don't continue in sin. It, it's a flow right out of the previous verses. We cannot live continually in sin. We may sin, but we don't continue to live in sin. Here's the thing. 
when the believer sins, the Holy Spirit convicts their heart. When he convicts their heart, it's time for us to repent. And we cannot live continually in sin. We just can't keep doing it. It's going to bother us. Now look, if you say that you're a child of God, and you have a continual sin that you just keep doing and doing and doing and doing and doing, you ought to question your relationship with the Lord. Now, that is not to say, and I don't want to be, don't want to be misunderstood here, I'm not saying that you can't commit the same sin more than once. I'm not saying that. If you're saying there's no way you can commit the same sin more than once, that's not what I mean. But if you live continuing sin, there's no conviction in your heart, and you don't feel the need to repent, and you don't think you need to get right with God, something's seriously wrong. And you really need to examine your spiritual relationship. And that's what he's saying. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. God keeps us from the wicked one. And part of what John is saying here, and not all of it, but part of it is that we are to be different than the world. We're to be separate from the world. We're not to live exactly the way the world lives. Now, some things we're going to do the same as everybody else, aren't we? I mean, we get up in the morning, we get dressed in the morning, we go to work or school or wherever we're going for the day, and uh, we carry on our day's activities just like other people do. And we should. Shouldn't be any difference to us. Well, where's this line of separation when other people do that, which we know is against God's word, against God's will? We're not to do those things. John expands on that. In verse 19, he says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. We are not, as a child of God, to participate in wickedness, in those things which we know to be wickedness. In verse 20, he says, And we know that the Son of God has come. No doubt about that. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now that's that's pretty clear. God has given us understanding. He's given us the ability to understand and discern the truth. Jesus is him who is true, and we are in him. Therefore, Jesus is the true God and eternal life. And finally, he says, little children, little ones in the faith. Keep yourselves from idols. Amen. There's so many idols in our world today. There are statues of gods and goddesses, as there have been for thousands of years. Those aren't the only idols. People make idols out of all sorts of things. I've heard it said, and I believe it's true, that anything that becomes more important to you than God becomes an idol. Anything that comes between you and God becomes an idol. <coughs> now that gives a wide range of possibilities. Of it. Well, what am I going to do about that? Put the Lord first in your life. That's what you want to do about it. When we believe in the Son of God and believe on the Son of God, we are born again. We become the children of God. We are lovers of God and lovers of the brother. We are equipped to deal with sin. We have the witness of God in ourselves, and we have the written record of God, and we have God himself in our life. We are promised to answer prayer, and we are to keep ourselves from the sins of this world, and keep ourselves from the idols of this world. It all starts. It all starts when we believe. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for this time we've had together this evening. Lord, it is my earnest prayer that you'd help us to know and understand that whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're about to sing a hymn of invitation. I'm going to leave the platform and stand down. If you're here tonight, you're not 100% certain that when you breathe your last breath, when you close your eyes for the last time, that you're going to step into the presence of God and be with Him forever. By that I mean you know and understand that like everybody else here, you are a sinner. 
but that Jesus loves you. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. He's alive today, and he'll forgive you if you'll trust him. And you have trusted him, therefore you know, according to 1 John 5, 13, that you have eternal life. If you're not sure about that, you'd like to get it settled, I want you to come meet me down in front. As soon as we begin to sing, you come. Maybe you're here tonight, I suppose most people are, and say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. Thank God for you. But perhaps the Lord is speaking to you in a different way. And perhaps there's something that he's laid on your heart, a decision you need to make, or a matter about which you need prayer. This is your opportunity to respond. You come while we sing. Father, bless the Lord this invitation time we can pray. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together.